What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekaWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be showing you how to build a $1500 gaming PC build step by step for 2020. I'm going to run through all the parts I selected and why before putting this system together and then booting it up to see exactly how it performs in some of the latest and most popular titles. Let's get into the build though after a quick word from today's video sponsor. The new GF65 Thin and Light Notebooks from MSI are powered by GeForce RTX 2060 graphics and feature a 120Hz display so you can play your favourite RTX titles seamlessly. If you order before July 30th, you'll get Death Stranding for free, which can even hit 4K 60fps on a 2060, using NVIDIA's AI image reconstruction tech called DLSS. Available now on Dixon's from £999 at the first link below. Now, as always, I'm going to start off by installing our CPU and our RAM, that way round, into our motherboard. Now, the motherboard I've selected is MSI's MEG Z490 Unify. It's kind of smaller than my head. This board has a super stealthy blackout design and is going to look amazing for today's build. We're going to lift our CPU socket up just like so, and then line the golden triangle on the corner of our processor with the corresponding triangle on the corner of our socket. The chip will then super gently drop into place. You can give it a bit of a wiggle if you like, and then pop the arm back down, and our black protective CPU socket cover will fly straight off. Specifically, this is Intel's new Core i5-10600K, and I know Intel chips are a bit of a controversial choice nowadays, but as far as mini ITX builds go and single-threaded and multi-threaded performance, this does tick all of the boxes. I'm also going to go ahead and install our RAM today, and this is brand new from Adata's XPG lineup. It's 16 gigabytes of pretty quick 3200 megahertz D50 memory with a really cool RGB zone up top. To install your RAM, you're going to pull back the clips on the top uh, of your motherboard dim slots and line the notch on the RAM dim up with the corresponding notch on your motherboard. It's then simply a case of applying even pressure to both sides, which will nicely secure both our RAM dims into place. Next up then, I'm going to move the motherboard into the case, and this is NZXT's H210. When I first saw this case design, I was really, really impressed, and I wanted to do a build with it. So I went on Amazon, I picked one up, and the rest is history. <laughs> Just got to figure out how to get this side panel off. Oh, there we go. Whoa, I'm gonna do the same around the back and then finally remove this bag of case screws and accessories and stuff like that, which we're gonna use to install our motherboard. Specifically, it's these screws we're gonna need and we're only gonna need to use four of them one for each of the holes on the corner of this diddy little motherboard. We can then go ahead and slide the motherboard into place and screw it in on each of the four corners. Next up today then, I'm gonna install the CPU cooler. And here I selected Cooler Master's ML120R. Right then, this is actually simpler than it looks. For Intel CPUs, we need to install these two brackets onto the bottom of our water block. We're then gonna take this back plate and with the solid side, not the kind of skeleton side. We're gonna pop these metal pins through and secure them with black plastic tabs like these. That assembly is then gonna pop through the holes in the back of the motherboard with these black spacers going on top. And then we can quite easily secure the water block part on our CPU. I do though first need to remove a couple of the pre-installed fans. As I'm planning to install the radiator at the back, there isn't going to be room at the front for our graphics card and this radiator, so better to play it safe here. All we've then got to do is pop a little bit of thermal paste on. That is plenty enough. And don't forget to remove this awkward bit of cellophane before finally screwing the water block and the CPU cooler radiator into place. The next step though is going to be to install our storage and do some of our wiring. For the SSD, I've got a brand new drive that you guys might not have heard of yet. And it's their 870 Cuvo drive, available in one, two, four or I think eight terabyte capacities. It's actually a pretty quick SATA drive with loads of storage. I'm going to remove this cool magnetic SSD mount and use these M3 flat screws that we get with our case. 
to line it up and secure it down really, really easily. I'm then going to grab a SATA data cable from the motherboard box and magnetically pop the drive back into place. Next up, it's time to really power this system up. Oops, really power this system up with this power supply here from Corsair. While it's true that I've used this power supply quite a lot now, that's for good reason, because it's a solid 750 watt, pretty efficient performer. You need to take one of your SATA data cables and plug this up to the interface on the power supply and do the same for our dual six plus two pin PCIe power cable. I'm then gonna remove the screws at the back of the unit and remove this small form factor power supply converter plate, which we aren't gonna need. Then we're gonna take the power supply and fan facing downwards, line it up with those holes we revealed just a second ago in the back of the case before screwing our power supply into place. I'm also gonna now run our 24 pin motherboard power cable and our four plus four pin CPU power connector to their corresponding ports on the top left of the motherboard and the top right of the motherboard respectively. While we're in the rhythm of plugging stuff in, I'm gonna pop in our front panel connectors and they're what power these ports at the top of the case. The first is the HD audio and that goes to the bottom left of the motherboard. There's a pin missing so don't force it. Next up is our front panel connectors, so that's our power, reset, power LED, all that good stuff. And in this case, it's already one pre-configured block. And that means you can just plug it straight in next to HD audio on the left-hand side of the motherboard. Next up, we've got our two USB connections, USB-C and USB-A. USB-C is the smaller of the two and plugs in just above the USB 3 connector on the right hand side of the motherboard. While we're here, I'm also gonna plug up the other end of our SATA data cable to our motherboard just above our USB 3, as well as taking a SATA power cable and plug in this into our SSD just like so. Now then, it's finally time for the moment we've all been waiting for, our graphics card. And this is, this is gonna be a tight fit. Do you see what I'm saying now? <laughs> this is gonna be fun. First up, we need to spin the case around and remove both of our PCIe covers and hold onto these screws. And that's gonna allow us to kind of line the graphics card up. We're struggling so far, so I'm gonna remove this red accent piece and that will just make sure we've definitely got enough clearance for our graphics card. So, I think, <laughs> oh my God, uh, it is in. How much of a good idea it is, I'm not sure, but I guess we're gonna find out. <laughs> All that's left to do then, I think, is plug our graphics card up, install that RGB fan we had left over at the front of the case, and then boot this machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Roll the montage. Are you ready for us? Okay then, now that you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up, let's take a dive in and see how it performs. I've tested it with eight of the most popular games, some new titles, some slightly older titles, so you, you can get a really precise picture and know exactly what to expect if you built this for yourself. The first is GTA 5, a few years old now, but still so, so popular. 1440p high settings uh, with the render bars set at around halfway. We're looking between 90 and 115 frames per second. And that's tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. So if you want to go back and compare and contrast against some of my other builds, you're more than able to do so. Next up is Overwatch. It's got that arcade feel, it's got that fun factor. I mean, who doesn't love it? It also performs really well at 1440p, pretty much ultra settings across the board between 180 and 200 frames per second. Overwatch is a slightly easier title to run, but to get esports level frame rates at 1440p maxed out on the settings front is pretty insane. Next on the list is Call of Duty's Warzone. At 1440p high settings, of course, no ray tracing in the Battle Royale mode, you're looking between 80 and 100 frames per second. Visually, the game looks so, so good though. It's super sharp, it's super fluid, super responsive, and has that really great frame rate to back things up. 
Talking of really great frame rates, next up is CSGO. It's probably the easiest game to run on the list today, but it's so, so popular even after all this time, which is why I've tested it. 1440p ultra settings, you're looking 300 plus frames per second, which is insane. Sometimes people ask me to test CSGO on low settings at 1080p, because that's how all the pros play it, but you can't possibly need more than 300 FPS in CSGO. And if you think you do, let's, <laughs> let's argue about it in the comment section below. That's, that's just crazy. The next game on the list today is Valorant. Like CSGO, it's pretty easy to run, despite it's, it's definitely better graphical kind of settings and viewing experience, if you will. And at 1440p high settings, you're looking 250 plus frames per second. Once again, you know, there's no need to be dropping down the, uh, the settings on this machine if you want those really high frame rates, because it's got you covered. I've also tested Fortnite today. It's another one of the Battle Royale titles uh, on my list. And this is one of those games that when you dive back in and give it a play, you're like, actually, I can see why this is so fun. 1440p epic, you're looking 215 frames per second. So you Fortnite fans out there, this PC has got you on lock. The penultimate game on my list today is Apex Legends, the final Battle Royale title. And at 1440p high settings, you're looking between 80 and 150 50 frames per second and don't be put off by that massive difference in the two that just depends on what scenes you're in when you're diving out into the world your frame rate is going to be lower as it kind of gets used to all those assets and has to render in what is a huge scene from up above finally then the last game today is forza horizon 4 i always include this bit of a favorite of mine and one of the more difficult racing games to run graphically here you're looking 1440p ultra settings, 140 FPS. It's one of those titles today that you could easily run at 4K and get a really, really playable experience and some high frame rates. But I think 1440p is the real sweet spot for today's build and testing everything at every resolution would just take years. So we can't do that, unfortunately. With that being said though, I think that pretty much wraps it up for today's video. If you did enjoy it, you know what to do. A big old like rating, get subscribed and shout at me in the comments section below with video ideas or feedback or suggestions or even questions. But I think that wraps it up. So thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. One.